Uh, Ellen Cordner is, uh, is our host this morning, and uh, just, uh, just uh, thank you for, for serving us today. I was uh, following along with some of the comments, and uh, we've been ha- seeing miracles and seeing answered prayer. In fact, the couple we met last night I had not met. They had been watching in Houston, Texas. Uh, but uh, one of the people that we've been praying for is Coburn, uh, Coburn Twiddell. And uh, Coburn has uh, cerebral palsy, uh, and yet he's been going through this time of healing. And he wrote in this morning uh, during the worship time, he says, uh, speaking of praise, I've been on four pain pills, high-powered pain pills for 20 years, and I am down to one half of a tablet at nighttime. God is healing me. So we're just uh, excited for what God is, uh, is doing. We are going to start a new series of thoughts today out of 1 Corinthians. You may want to take your Bibles there. This um, series of thoughts will be a study through 1 Corinthians, and we'll do that. Um, It'll take us through the end of the summer. And so I want to just uh, give a bit of an introduction to it today, because when Paul was visiting on his missionary journeys in Ephesus, he often traveled over, at least he traveled over twice Uh, to Corinth. And Corinth was an interesting town. Uh, Mountains are surrounding it, and there were these temples underneath that. Um, In these temples, there were up to a thousand temple prostitutes who were a part of the community of Corinth. Of course, that was a great reminder to the Corinthian Christians uh, of what they had been delivered from and the paganism that they had been delivered from. Now, evidence seems to indicate that there were four letters that were written. We only have 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians that have remained, but there were four letters that Paul actually wrote to the Corinthian people. And when we read the letter or the letters, we soon discover that there is a church that is in some maturity crisis, They're in this place where they're needing to grow. They're needing to grow up. They're needing to move toward unity, and they're needing to move toward maturity. And so Paul is addressing many of the issues that they face. As I read 1 Corinthians a little while ago, I began thinking that some of the same issues that they were facing are some of the same issues that we're facing today in, in the church world. Um, just, a, just some of the stuff we'll be studying over these next weeks um, is to guard ourselves against arrogance. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit today. How can we develop a culture of honor so that we honor one another and we honor leaders and we honor those who are around us and with us? How to visit the courts of heaven instead of being a litigious society that visits the courts of man. In our society, we visit the courts of man way too much, and the courts of heaven way too little. We'll be talking about it. We're going to talk about sexual immorality in the church and without, outside of the church. We're going to be talking about def- defining and developing godly marriages. Um, we're going to be careful. To, we'll be talking about being careful to not put a stumbling block in in each other's way? Or what does true freedom really look like? One of those things we'll be studying. We'll be revisiting communion. We'll be understanding the excesses of the gifts of the Spirit. And we'll be talking about the gifts of the Spirit and how everyone has them and how they're to operate within order within the local body of believers and how we can do that more effectively and then how to live in a spirit of generosity. Now, the letter seems to have been written toward a woman by the name of Chloe. Chloe had a group of people who were meeting in her house. In fact, in the reading we'll get to here in a little bit, uh, Chloe is mentioned. Now, a part of that house church that Chloe was leading was a guy by the name of Sosthenes. Sosthenes was actually um, the head of the synagogue, but when Paul came through to Corinth, He gave his heart to the Lord, which meant, according to Acts chapter 18, verse 17, he developed, uh, he came under persecution and uh, had to actually leave um, the Corinth area for a period of time. 
he hung out with Paul, where Paul learned more about the Corinthian church and how to help them. And so I want to begin, and we won't be long this morning as we introduce this, and the goal is, is for you to read um, at least a chapter in 1 Corinthians every week as we prepare. For example, next week we'll be in chapter 2. But I want to begin with verse 10 today in chapter 1. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Somebody say perfectly united. In mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. That what I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. By the way, Apollos was a Greek leader who was said to have these eloquent oratorical skills. Another said, I follow Cephas. We know Cephas is who? Peter. Another said, I don't follow any of those. I follow Christ. Well, it doesn't say that like that. It says still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God, he says, that I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one of you can say you were baptized in my name. Yes, I baptized the house hold of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross be emptied of its power. That's where we're going to focus today. Lest the cross be emptied of its power. Let me go on for, to verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness, to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. I want to give you uh, five things today. There will not be unity. There will not be unity and maturity in the body of Christ where, where there's division. Now, the word division is an interesting word. It means divergent visions. We're not all rowing in the same direction. We have different focus. We have different priorities. We have different mandates, so to speak. And so there can never be unity, nor can there be maturity in a church body or in the big C church where there is division. It just can't happen. Now, it seems that there are four different factions that are going on in the Corinthian church. The first one is simply the group that says, well, Paul's the best. And then there's the second group that says, yeah, I don't get off on Paul that much. I, I really prefer Apollos. I mean, it's Apollos who, that really does it for me. And then another group who says, have you heard Peter preach? I mean, come on. Paul, oh man. And Apollos, I don't get all that rhetoric stuff. I am into Cephas. And then there's the super spiritual group who says we shouldn't be following any man. We only follow Jesus because we're a little more spiritual than the rest of you. And so there was these factions within the body of Christ. And now, granted, all of us have our favorites. All of us have people that are easier for us to listen to than others. But here's where we go wrong. If we get to the point where only one person can teach us, we're going to miss out on what Holy Spirit wants to show us. If, if you have to be that picky that you can't learn from someone other than your favorite, then you've got a problem in the body of Christ. We go through that um, very often, I know online, I get texts from some of you that say, why didn't you preach this weekend? Well, I didn't preach this weekend because I wasn't here. And um, we have a teaching team, 
and uh, don't dare turn off the, the, the message like his pastor Rick laid down an amazing teaching last week that all of us should have grabbed a hold of and got. See, if we get to the point where we say, I can't learn from somebody who's not my favorite, then we're going to have division and we'll never be mature and complete. Some people say, well, I can never learn from a woman. And by the way, it's usually not women who say that. <laughs> Just saying. By the way, buddy, you better be able to learn from a woman. I mean, um, whew. this one down here teaches me a lot. And uh, we can't, if, 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 you, if you've got to predetermine who it is that you can learn from, you'll, you'll not be mature and you'll not be complete. I mean, I have my favorites. There's some that I, I can listen to more than others. Um, I listened to somebody, I'm not going to tell you who it was, somebody that I typically haven't liked. And I liked what they said because Holy Spirit gave me something that I didn't have, even though I had to look past their facial thing that bugs me or whatever. <laughs> and so you got to be careful on getting to the point of who it is that you will allow to teach you. And that's where the Corinthian, the Corinthian church was. We can do that with worship. We can go, oh no, they're leading worship today. Oh, I bet they'll sing that song I don't like. By the way, if that song is about Jesus, you might need to be careful saying you don't like it. Amen. And so, anyway, um, you know, let's, let's keep moving because I'm going to get in trouble. Number two, when there's division in the body of Christ, it serves to empty the cross of its power. That's really where we want to land a lot today. Paul is saying, I may not be as eloquent as Apollos, or even as full of wisdom as Cephas, but if you depend on being entertained by worship, or if you depend on who it is that is ringing your bell in the teaching capacity, I'm going to tell you, you will stay an infant longer than you should stay an infant. Paul says to the Hebrew people, he says, by this time you ought to be ready for meat, but you're only choosing milk. By the way, I want to tell you that milk has to do with comfort. Meat has to do with change, which is why sometimes we're more comfortable with milk than we are with meat. By the way, talking about the church as a whole and talking about the body of Christ, this whole thing of maturity and unity, by the way, you can't have unity if you don't have maturity. And if you don't step into some level of unity, you can never develop maturity. But we have these preferences. There are people in towns like ours who favor their denominational label or, lab or, or, or church more than they favor Jesus. By the way, if I favor where I go to church more than I favor who the Lord is in my life, I will be immature and I will not be walking, walking in unity. Do you ever wonder why we hear these stories of of miracles in third world countries. I mean, there are many stories of the dead being raised in Africa, legitimate stories that have happened of blind eyes being opened, of hearing being restored. I saw, I saw that myself in Laos. Come back to America and you go, didn't see that. Didn't see that. Don't see that. Do you ever wonder, the Bible says Jesus is the same today as he was yesterday, and he will be that way tomorrow. And I'm pretty aggravated that I don't see more healings. I said, I'm pretty aggravated that I don't see more healings. I mean, and, and we, we should see more signs and wonders in the body of Christ. Do you ever wonder why we don't? I'd like to suggest to you that if we're so married 
to our flavors, whether it's a denominational flavor or whether it is a local church or whether it's a pastor that we love so much, I'd like to suggest to you that we have division and we don't have unity and maturity and because we have division, the cross is emptied of its power. And we're not going to see what the Bible talks about with miracles, signs and wonders, and healing. Now, some of you may think all of that ended in the book of Acts, but I'm telling you, the book of Acts is still waiting to be written. And in a town like ours, we've got to figure out how we can all work together for the kingdom cause. Because if we're going to see the king in the house and the king blessing his church, we can't see the cross emptied of its power. And the cross is emptied of its power every time there is division in the body of Christ. By the way... um, some years ago, can we just have a conversation here today? I know I'm the only one with the mic, so it's kind of... A... <laughs> Several years ago, the church got to the point that we said, um, let's stop being offensive. Anybody here glad that Jesus never stopped being offensive? Amen. I mean, and we, 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 said, we said, let's not offend anyone. So some churches started dumbing down the gospel by eliminating words like the cross and the blood. We wouldn't talk about the cross or the blood. We called it seeker-sensitive. But if you take away the cross and you take out the blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. So then no wonder we don't talk about sin either. Because, oh, I don't want to offend you. But I want to tell you, we have a sin problem because we have a Savior problem. And the Savior, He's not the problem. He's waiting to forgive sin in Jesus' name. And so I'd like to just suggest to us that we wonder why we don't see more and I, would, I think that much of the reason is because we're all in our little holy huddles thinking we're more spiritual than the rest and there's no unity in that. Consequently, there will never be maturity in that. If somebody knows Jesus, I need to be really careful that I don't criticize the anointing that's on their life. Uh, it would be good if people didn't criticize what's going on at Grace. It would be good if what's going on at XYZ other church somewhere here doesn't get criticized. Can't we just thank God for all of His blessings, for all of His children, and we say we just want to keep our eyes on Jesus. We don't want to keep our eyes on favorites or our label because we don't want to ever empty the cross of its power. Are you getting what I'm throwing down at all? Okay. So, now, let's let's keep going. Be careful what you call foolish. It's interesting, 1 Corinthians uh, 1, 22 through 25, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. By the way, if you have to have your choice between signs and wonders and wisdom or Christ crucified... Always take Christ crucified, okay? Because it's a, Christ crucified then is a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. I really need to be careful in criticizing someone's anointing that I don't like. 
because I might be taking on the Holy Spirit. Because the anointing they're carrying came from Him. Now, I might not agree with them, okay? And we're not talking about agreeing. We're talking about not being judgmental because if I'm judgmental, I'm being foolish because when I'm judgmental, I'm not walking in maturity or unity. Oh, this is going to be a fun study. So, um, by the way, um, would you have chosen you Well, now, <laughs> most of us wouldn't have chosen us. Now, on one hand, you need to get over that because he did choose you. Okay, yeah, that's a good response. Thank you, Lord. Okay, because he chose the, the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. See, um, he uses the term in these verses, he says, not many of you were wise by human standards, not many of you were influential, and not many of you were from nobility. By the way, if we all were from nobility, or we all were from, from influence, or we all were wise by human standards, we would be stinking up the place with our narcissism. So he did choose you, so, now, don't get so hung up on, I, I can't believe he could possibly use somebody like me. Step into the miracle that he will always use people like you, okay? Because he uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, okay? So, he wants us to put him on display, even though we ourselves aren't all that in a bag of chips, and so he wants, to, he wants to help us understand that greater is he that's in us than the he that's in the world. By the way, um, I'm saying by the way a lot again. Um, I love a story that Bill Johnson told. He talked about this uh, trio of girls that sang this amazing song. And he went up to one of them after they had sang the song and said, said to her, said, that was really great. And she said, well, it was all Jesus. And Bill said, it wasn't that great. <laughs> See, because sometimes we are giving him credit for our best. And he takes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. If it was all Jesus every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, here's the teaching Paul's given us. Don't be following Paul. Don't be following Apollos. Don't be following Cephas. Don't just be following a religious Christ crucified. You follow and keep your eyes on, on him. If you have a boast, your boast should only be in the Lord. Let me just wrap up with this, this story. I told you I'd be quick. Every boast, this is number, f I skipped number four. That's good. Give me number four so these guys can write the blank in. But now let's go to number five. If you ever boast, it needs to be about Jesus. We had uh, some friends in just recently, and um, they were really into... Um, the NCAA Women's Final Four or the NCAA Tournament. And um, we kind of, after they left, go, that was pretty good. You know, um, what's the girl from Iowa? I knew you would know because you <laughs> are from Iowa. Caitlin Clark, man, she can shoot the ball. And I started noticing um, the Women's Final Four. And... Um, I listened to an interview. Did anybody hear uh, the interview from Don Staley, who was the coach of the, what is South Carolina, the Gamecocks? Okay, anybody from Gamecock country in here? Didn't think so. Anybody from Bison country in here? Or? Okay, didn't think so. 
Okay. So she was, she was talking about um, the Lord. And, you know, I've heard athletes ad infinitum say, oh, I just want to praise my Lord and Jesus, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I mean, that's been in vogue for a lot of years for athletes to say. But Don Staley said something more profound when she was interviewed. And of course, the Gamecocks won the national championship of, of women's basketball. She said this. She said, there's something wrong with you if you don't believe in God. Well, now that hit the press. There's something wrong with you if you don't believe in God. She said, if you're just tuning in for one interview, this is her retort to it, and you probably heard it from somebody else who heard it from somebody else, then you can have your take on it. I'm not apologizing. She said, I thank God for his work in my life. And I'm not going to apologize for what I said or what I feel because it makes you feel uncomfortable. I know why things have happened in my life. And I'm going to salute my God as much as I can because I know where I am is not my own doing. It's God that's working in me. That's a good testimony. I wonder what had happened in a town like ours if we never boasted about grace. We just boasted about Jesus. If we never boasted about a building we're building, we just boast about Jesus. We don't boast about how great the worship is or how good this is or how bad that is. But we just say, I'm not following Paul. I'm not following Apollos. You thought I was going to say Rick, didn't you? I'm not following Steph, uh, no, Cephas. I'm going to follow Jesus. He's my boast. Because here's the deal. There can never be maturity and unity if he's not the center of it all. And I don't know about you, but I want to move my life to be mature and unified for the glory of God. That the whole world will know that Jesus is the one, that Jesus is the answer, and that Jesus is my hope. Amen? God bless you.